So I just want to uh, welcome everybody back and uh, to our second part of the Eyes on a Cure Mini Summit Spring Updates. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here. For those of you who were not here earlier, just wanted to briefly touch base. This was our first panel. We had four amazing speakers, Dr. Jason Luke, Dr. Sapna Patel, Dr. Alexandra Ganji, and Dr. O Ahmed Hamid, sorry, um, and they did some wonderful presentations on clinical trials. Um, if you missed that, that will be uh, recorded um, and we will have those recordings up um, in the next couple days, so stay tuned for an email for that. Um, and now I'm just really excited because we're gonna have the um, next panel. We have three amazing speakers and we're all focusing on the patient journey. So we'll be talking about surveillance, support, and the patient perspective. Really excited to have Dr. Takami Sato, Emily Rasile, and Aaron Davis, who is a patient, um, to join us today and just talk about um, surveillance, uh, low vision rehab and resources, and then hear Aaron's story about being a patient. Um, so I'm going to stop my screen for just a minute. There we go. Um, and then I'm also going to um, quickly pull up um, this. I apologize for the lag. Um, so first, what I would like to do is um, introduce our first speaker, um, and that is Dr. Takami Sato. Um, Dr. Sato is the Director of Metastatic Uveal Melanoma at Thomas Jefferson University. He's devoted his career to improving the understanding of ocular melanoma and developing new treatments, particularly for patients who've developed a systemic recurrence. Dr. Sato's studies focus on cancer immunotherapy or the use of the immune system to fight cancer. His group recently reported that by using liver-directed treatments, the overall survival of uveal melanoma patients with liver metastasis has significantly improved. Dr. Sato is building on these outcomes as he continues to examine methods of treating metastatic melanoma and delaying its progression. So Dr. Sato, I just want to welcome you and I'm gonna let you take it away to talk about surveillance. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So I think I'm talk to uh, talk about surveillance in UVM melanoma still very controversial. So, but I try to make it simple and then we have a time to get some question later. So therefore, if you have any question, let me know, okay? I'm gonna share the screen quick. There you go. Uh, you think you, you see, right? Okay. So, oh gosh. That's a move. Here you go. This is my uh, conflict interest. So just refresh your memory. Uh, I will just explain the eye melanoma briefly. 80% uh, of the all primary eye migrants in adult. In other words, eye melanoma is most common uh, tumor in adults, primary tumor. So the, uh, it's still a very rare tumor. So we see there are 2,000 to 3,000 uh, patients per year. Uh, obviously, this is a Caucasian dominant disease, and then compared to skin melanoma, it's very rare cancer, only 4 to 5 percent of melanoma, for instance. Uh, age is picked at uh, in the 60s, but uh, we also see the patient uh, in a very, very younger age. And total survival rate, cure rate, uh, has not changed in general. Uh, in other words, uh, 20 to 40, 50 percent patient die from the cancer, uh, from especially metastasis. And the liver is a dominant organ uh, of the metastasis in the majority of patients. So the, currently, we are much more clear uh, what is going to happen. So the issue is that we don't have a very good weapon to take care of that. But anyway, so tumor is categorized based on two different types of mutation. The first mutation is going to be driver mutation which is a GIP coupling protein mutation, including the GNAQ, GNA ribbon, CCMTR2, uh, PLCP4. Uh, this mutation make the melanocytic cell grow faster. But in general, this doesn't make the tumor uh, metastasis to that organ. The most important thing is the second uh, mutation set, uh, behavior determination gene. So you probably you, you may have heard from somebody, but uh, there are three mutations uh, we are known right now. The EIF1 AX mutation, uh, if tumor has it, uh, tumor doesn't go any place, uh, cured by the radiation treatment to the eye. 
So uh, on the other hand, BAPUA mutation this located in chromosome three uh, uh, make the tumor cell easy to escape from the eye and tend to go to the liver and then grow and then kill the patient. So the another mutation that is very unique is a SFCD1 mutation. This is in a tumor cell. Uh, patient tumor has it, uh, tend to develop metastasis very late. And sometimes metastasis in the, not in the liver, but in the lung or other organs. So this kind of characteristic of a tumor is de uh, defined by this kind of mutation. And recently, PREM uh, has been uh, reported. Uh, PREM is not a mutation gene, mutated gene, but the expression of PREM make the tumor cell more aggressive, uh, especially class 1B, class 1 tumor with PREM. 30% uh, patient developed metastasis. So this is kind of a summary of the uh, mutation uh, analysis or meaning of that. So this is kind of a paper from the uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you know, on the uh, left side, uh, you know, BAP1 mutation to, uh, patient uh, tumor uh, tend to kill the patient very quickly, like 2.5 years of peak. So on the other hand, after five years, still some uh, deaths, but uh, it's much less. Uh, in contrast, SFCB1 mutation make the tumor cell uh, decolorize a little bit late. And then uh, after 10 years, uh, you still have some patient that from the disease. So therefore, obviously, survival curve is like two peak. Uh, one peak is BAPA mutation peak. The second peak is SFCB1 mutation. So now, uh, if we know that, we can just probably change the uh, way of uh, uh, you know, uh, surveillance uh, based on this. Now, uh, confusion is there a couple different type of testing. Uh, then uh, there are two, uh, I would say maybe just summarize into two. So uh, first, a set of testing is so-called RNA testing. So Castle Bioscience, class one, class two. They uh, categorize tumor into uh, three categories right now uh, based on the 15 gene expression in the melanoma cell. And class one a is a good tumor. Uh, good, not, <laughs> tumor is not always not good, but uh, a low risk uh, metastasis for tumor. And only 2% of patients that develop metastasis within five years. On the other hand, class two, uh, more than 70% patient develop metastasis within five years. Uh, this is not the death metastasis and the patient survive after that. But uh, there's different type of uh, testing, so-called genetic testing, uh, impact genetics or even Pennsylvania testing. And they uh, check the chromosome uh, pattern of the melanoma cell. And then uh, if a uh, tumor uh, has disomy 3, intact chromosome 3, five years survival, not the metastasis uh, rate is 87% compared to the control of a patient of 94, 94, less than 5%, 10% death rate. So uh, in contrast, more than three, a uh, five-year survival rate is 57% compared to 91% uh, in uh, healthy people. So that means a 30 to 40% patient have died from cancer within uh, five years. And then if patient uh, tumor has 8Q gain or amplication in addition to uh, chromosome uh, C abnormality loss, so uh, like, uh, this rate is very similar to that of class two tumor patient. So based on uh, this, uh, we can uh, estimate how uh, you know seriously uh, we have to follow the patients. And then uh, this chromosome analysis, uh, there's a calculator, uh, so called LAMPO, uh, L-U-M-P-O. Uh, you can check the, uh, the websites. Uh, okay. So what we should do? It's still where you go. Uh, you know, doctor has a different opinion. It's very confusing because they have a different opinion. So majority of your opinion is uh, if you do this surveillance, uh, genetic testing, or uh, risk factor testing, we should be able to find the tumor in the early stage, therefore have a chance to get a more treatment and know in clinical trial. So therefore uh, we can, we may potentially change the outcome. So the different opinion, this is, I think it's a minority. However, still there are people who are saying so. I don't have anything to offer, so don't test. I don't need to know. And then if something happens, that's your destiny. So that's thing. Also, the multiple testing costs the you know, medical, uh, uh, you know, out of expense, also anxiety of patient. So the exposure to radiation uh, may increase the risk of cancer in the future. So therefore, pros and cons, uh, you should just think of it, and doctors should talk to doctor about that. 
However, uh, this is kind of, as of today, general guideline called the MCCN guideline. So, uh, you know, I, I, I can share, probably uh, they can share the uh, document. It's kind of more than 50 page, but this is only one page summary. So there is a category two minus three, low risk, medium risk, high risk, Low risk is a class 1A, disomy 3, you know, here, X mutation. Sometimes uh, they don't recommend any testing or anything. Uh, but uh, you, generally speaking, they consider surveillance every 12 months. Then uh, high risk, class 2, more than 3, HQ application, buffer mutation, premium expression, large tumor. They tend to met, uh, metastasize with RE and at a very high incidence. So therefore, uh, this MCCN guideline recommend surveillance imaging for every six, three to six months for five years, then six to ten months for the next uh, best, best, of the year, best of the year time. So, and then in between is class 1B, SA3B1 mutation, the medium sign. So, this is kind of general uh, surveillance, uh, you know. Uh, Recommendations, therefore, if you can bring this to your doctor, probably they just follow it. So, the, which kind of test we should do? This is also very controversial, but uh, I will just show you the one uh, very good study from the uh, Lactala. So, especially focused on the mid, uh, middle one, uh, you know, or if uh, compared to uh, number of the autosome and then uh, auto uh, MRI tumors are fine, how many tumors are fine? So obviously, MRI is much more sensitive if, uh, you know, ultrasound pick up the two tumor and the MRI may 10, 8, 5, you know, so therefore MRI is much more sensitive compared to uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound and the CAT scan has no clear difference. So this is one example. Uh, there are multiple tiny dots here and then, uh, you know, this very early stage of discovery of metastasis by MRI. But the MRI uh, requires specific, uh, like a test uh, condition. We usually recommend EOVIS contrast dye, uh, and then uh, we, we recommend diffusion weighted image. So if you want to just ask for the MRI uh, surveillance, uh, make sure these two conditions or two approaches kind of done. Okay. So they, they're still very confusing. But this is kind of Jefferson uh, for up, uh, you know, guideline. So we high risk is very similar across to more than three percent HQ application, more than fifty percent risk of systemic recurrence. So MRI of the abdomen is important because 80, 90 percent tumor develop in the liver. So therefore, every three months for two years, then every six months for additional three years, then uh, uh, every once a year. Uh, uh, lung is second uh, common site, so therefore we order CT scan just every six months for two years, then once a year for three years, and then uh, change to chest x because especially for bad blood mutation, uh, tumor development metastasis early in uh, I don't know, within five years. So the blood test is not useful at all in general, but LDH is a little bit sensitive, and then we order CBC completely with the metabolic panel uh, before testing. Then uh, the, we don't separate low risk and intermediate risk because there is a potential so-called sampling error. So if tumor is so tiny and sometimes need a misty uh, uh, tumor, then make the long, uh, like a, a false uh, good news. So therefore we just order all kind of every six months for five years for intermediate low risk patient and then uh, once a year for five, five to 10 years. And then we have a baseline CT scan, but the uh, chest X-ray is going to be a uh, follow-up method because risk of having problem is much less. Uh, for the SF3B1 mutation, uh, some uh, testing is uh, like a, a castle will start doing this. Uh, if tumor has FS3B1 mutation, uh, this tends to develop metastasis in a later time, also sometime in the lung. So therefore we continue the MRI much, uh, much longer than other patient also which continues the ERA CT scan. So this is a kind of Jefferson very clear cut uh, recommendation and then any evidence uh, probably have to say this is uh, what we are doing. So and then thank you for this opportunity and then I uh, appreciate all kind of trust uh, you know we are working together as a, a member of the patient doctors who have to work, to work together as a team and then I have to um, tell that this is a long time ago image uh, picture because we can't do that because of COVID right now. Hopefully we can get together and take a picture together. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I will stop the sharing.
Thank you so much, Dr. Sato. Um, I think surveillance is just such a important piece of the journey and then having someone just kind of explain it because there's always so many questions um, is just invaluable. So we so appreciate your time today. Um, and just so everyone knows, we will be answering questions at the end of the presentations. So there is a Q&A section in the bottom um, of the screen. So please feel free to throw in any questions there so that we can get to those at the, the end. Um, next up, I would like to introduce Emily Vassal. Um, she's an assistant professor of the Department of Blindness and Low Vision Studies at Salus University and the program coordinator of the National Leadership Consortium in Sensory Disabilities at Salus University. She is certified in elementary education and special education in the state of New Jersey, as well as a certified teacher of students with visual impairments in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. She is also a certified low vision therapist through the Academy for Certification of Vision Rehabilitation and Educational Professionals. She continues her education through Salus University's Vision Rehabilitation Therapy Program and plans to earn her certification in Vision Rehabilitation Therapy through ACVREP. Her areas of expertise include low vision rehab, education of students with visual impairments, and self-advocacy. Emily, welcome. We're just so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, let me take a minute to share my share my screen with all of you, even though I know we just practiced this. Hopefully I can I can do it. Okay, are we good? Can everybody say it? Awesome. Um, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to be, I have a dual monitor um, system. So I'll be referring to the PowerPoint and looking a little bit off screen, but I'll try to maintain eye contact with you all. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Emily Vasile, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to be presenting on low vision rehabilitation and some resources for individuals who are navigating life as somebody with some low vision. Um, so within this, this time span, there's a lot to cover. Um, I have sent both Lauren and Liana uh, a handout as well as this PowerPoint for your reference um, following this presentation. So please uh, don't feel like you have to scramble notes down. You will all get this information afterwards. Um, so there are many different types of low vision tools and devices that low vision uh, rehabilitation therapists use um, to help people make the most of the vision that they have throughout their lives. So we have a lot of different categories here that I'm gonna be talking about. We have optical near and distance devices. And these are devices that help with near activities like reading and writing. They're distance, or they help with distance activities like watching sports games, um, whether it's on a TV or uh, an actual field, um, reading the chalkboard, et cetera. But, the point to know is that all of those devices must be prescribed by an eye doctor. These are not ones that should be purchased out um, at a convenience store or a pharmacy or things like that. We're also going to talk about optical device, non-optical devices. Excuse me. Um, these can be these can be purchased by the consumer um, through a variety of different stores and websites, uh, which you actually have the list on the handout of some really great websites that can um, that sell these products. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about video magnification. These are electronic devices that are used for both near and distance activities. So, um, and actually one of them, uh, a lot of us already have are our cell phones. Um, these, little, these little devices actually are wonderful for someone with low vision. Um, we also talk about glare control. So these, you might hear them called sun lenses or wearable filters. Um, these are prescriptive lenses that help to block glare and block light for people who have photophobia or um, dist um, excuse me, uh, glare and lighting sensitivities. And then we'll also talk about the mainstream products, like I mentioned, um, iOS and Android devices that are really becoming uh, quite popular. And the majority of people have some sort of device, whether it is a laptop or a phone or tablet or things like that. So a lot of those devices have built-in tools that you can use to help enhance your vision. So a little bit about optical near devices. I'm just gonna go through and talk a little bit about each one um, and what they're used for. So some of these you may have seen, these are handheld magnifiers, pocket magnifiers and stand magnifiers. All of these devices 
um, at least the ones pictured, all have a, uh, a light component to them that helps to illuminate the text or image underneath the magnifier. A lot of people, um, especially when their central vision is impacted, may need uh, additional lighting to help read um, and see images in front of you. So whether it is um, a light from overhead or a light directly on your device, this is a great tool because it allows you to turn the light on and off with it. Um, these are all battery and portable, or battery operated and portable. And they all pretty much function in very similar ways. However, their magnification level is different. Um, and so this is where prescription from a low vision specialist is necessary to be able to get you the exact magnification that you would need. Optical distance devices. So we have here on the left is a Max TV and the center is a VES Occutec and on the far right is a handheld monocular telescope. The two on the right, the VES Occutec and the monocular telescope, these are used for short-term distance activities. So a quick spot across the room, spot across the restaurant to find who's walking in, um, a quick standing on the street corner, want to see the street sign, make sure you're going in the right direction, things like that. Those are your quick short-term activities. The device on the left, the Max TV, is for a distance activity that is long-term. So whether you're sitting there watching television, watching a theatrical performance or in a sports game. These are glasses that you would put on and you could sit there and watch for longer term. Visual field enhancement devices are devices that maximize your visual field. So for people maybe who have some vision loss on the sides um, or top and bottom. So we have two different kinds of prisms. They're Pelly prisms or Fresnel prisms that stick onto a pair of glasses, whether they are prescription or um, non-prescriptive glasses, these can still be used. Sometimes you'll find that they're even ground into um, the glasses as well. Opticians are able to do that. A reverse telescope is pretty much taking the telescope you saw on the previous slide and flipping it around so it's reversed and it will actually broaden the view so it brings in the images from the side for people who have some field loss. There are some handheld video magnifiers that basically take what I'm going to be showing you on the next side and put it in a small, nice package of a handheld format. So these are devices that are often battery operated but need to be charged. Um, they're used for near and short term activities. So think writing a check, writing down your grocery list, um, maybe a quick crossword puzzle, uh, looking up some information in a book, things like that. Um, as you can see from some of the pictures, you can use the different tools on the sides to magnify the images, change color, change the contrast. You can also freeze these images with the camera feature that allows you to zoom in even closer. So taking that, that smaller version and now putting it into a bigger version, these are desktop video magnifiers that do require a table base because they are fairly heavy, the size of a computer, uh, or monitor screen. And they're electronic, so they do need to be plugged into an outlet. Um, but these are devices that can actually be used for both near and distance tasks and activities. Um, a lot of them have cameras that you can put on a self view to be able to see yourself up close, but you can also rotate to be able to see things far away as well. A lot of people will use these types of devices for reading a book or completing long forms, or even doing tasks like filling out their checks, creating lists, things like that. These are some non-optical devices. These are my favorite, mostly because they can be um, purchased without the, the sign off from from a, an eye care specialist. Um, so on the far le top left, we have a typoscope, which is a cutout um, that has a yellow, uh, translucent yellow um, film in it to help keep you tr on track by line by line when you're reading. To the right, we have some bold line paper and a bold line writer pen. Um, this helps just to create a bigger contrast between the texture writing and the background versus a regular ballpoint pen that's a lot finer. To the far right, we have wearable filters or sun lenses, as I mentioned previously. On the bottom left, we have a writing guide, which is great if, um, for writing purposes, you have trouble staying on the lines, 
it's great to help keep you in writing a straight line. Reading stands, changing the angle of the texture reading actually can really help reduce glare um, and help keep your ergonomically keep you, um, you know, sitting up straight rather than if you're, if you're needing to be close to a book and you're hunching over. And on the far right, we have acetate filters that also help to reduce glare on top of maybe a black or what black and white, um, white and black piece of um, text that you are reading. So it's really, really important. I feel like I can't stress enough how important it is that you know that optical devices have to be prescribed by an eye care professional who specializes in low vision. Um, if you go to a, a pharmacy or things like that and you, and you purchase like a magnifying glass on your own, you might not be getting the magnification that your eyes specifically need. And so you might say, I don't understand why this isn't working. It's a magnifying glass. It's supposed to make things bigger, but it might not be the magnification level that you need. So that's really important to be consulting a low vision specialist. Um, all of these types of devices should be evaluated by someone in a, what's called a clinical low vision examination. Very similar to when you go to your regular eye doctor. However, um, will probably take a little bit longer because they're looking for um, specifics in how you read, how you access print, and maybe what some of your goals are moving forward in how you use your vision. Specifically with video magnification, having a separate video magnification evaluation from a low vision therapist is, is highly recommended and sometimes often needed um, before you can purchase a device. Many state services uh, for people with visual impairments have quota funds that they use to help patients purchase devices such as these because they are fairly expensive. Um, but a lot of these services, these states, will not give patients um, or their, their case managers the money to purchase these devices unless documentation and an evaluation is performed in advance. Um, they don't just want to give out the money. They want to make sure that there's a solid reason and the, uh, the data has been collected on the specifics as to what the patient needs. Um, following receipt of any device, the patient should definitely be receiving either one or two or whatever the recommended prescription is of low vision rehab. This is really important so that way the patient knows how to properly use the device, how to troubleshoot if things go wrong, and then how to properly care for the device and maintain it. Um, just a little bit about these mainstream devices that we briefly talked about. All of the features on the right, so being able to magnify your screen, change background color, enlarge text, apply a color filter, invert your colors, decrease the screen brightness, um, text-to-speech, There's there are things called voiceover and talkback, audio descriptions, there are so many, and with all of these new updates that um, technology continues to come out with, excuse me, um, being able to do all of these things right on the small device in your hand is pretty cool. So I often recommend to a lot of people, maybe while they're waiting for their device to come in the mail or to be delivered, explore what you have on your phone because you never know what, um, what things will be available and actually help you out on your phone as well. And low vision therapists have a lot of experience using device features on their phones as well. Um, you can see in the very bottom picture, this person has their phone on um, zoom. So they have zoomed so that way they can see the app a lot closer, which this is the camera app. Um, so just a quick overview of the vision rehabilitation professionals that you may come in contact with. A certified low vision therapist, which is what I am, or a specialty certification in low vision that is specific to occupational therapists. Um, we are people who teach individuals how to use the remaining vision. Um, so we will be teaching you how to use these different devices and actually can help determine whether your environmental modifications in your home, in your office space, at work, wherever, are meeting your needs for how your vision currently is. Um, the next one is a certified vision rehabilitation therapist. These are people who teach adaptive independent living skills, and they work with people in a variety of settings, in rehab facilities, in their homes and employment settings. And certified orientation mobility specialists are the, are the um, 
professionals who teach safe and independent travel, whether that's in and outside of your homes. They also teach how to use a long cane effectively, if that is something that is determined to be effective for you. Um, teach you how to use electronic travel devices, human guides, site guide, as well as pre-cane skills. Um, all of these, um, excuse me, professionals uh, also are employed at a variety of um, VA hospitals as well, should you qualify for VA services. Um, different ones have different, I think, um, departments as far as how much vision, how much vision services are covered there, but um, that is another place where you can receive low vision services as well. Um, just to hit home on the the C piece, um, it's really important that when you're searching for these professionals, you look that they are certified, um, because a lot of people, you know, could take classes here and there within this field, but throughout vision rehabilitation, we are a very small um, and specialized niche. And so all of us who have that CLVT or that C in front of our names have been certified nationally by the Academy for Certification of Vision Rehabilitation and Education Professionals. I know that's a real mouthful. <laughs> um, but so just make sure that when you're doing your own research, you look for that certification because um, these are the people who have received that real specialized training in working with individuals with low vision. And then another, um, another resource that I absolutely really love, this is Vision Aware, which is a wonderful website for people um, navigating life as someone with low vision, whether you are new to low vision or whether this is something that you've been dealing with for a while. Um, they have a directory, which is pretty cool, um, that you can search by state and some of the examples of the things you can search for are low vision services, travel and O&M, um, transportation, daily living skills. So you select what you're looking for, you select your state, and up will pop a list of the resources that are available in your state. So this is really a wonderful place for you to, if you're completely lost and really don't know where to go, this is a great start just to see what's around, maybe in states nearby, or what is around your state as well. Not every state has state-run services. Sometimes they have nonprofit or independently run services as well. So that's good to keep in mind. And that's it. I tried to be as <laughs> concise as possible in my 10 minutes, um, but I did just wanted to show you very briefly. Um, can everyone still see the screen? If I... Mm -hmm. up over here, uh, wanting to show you what that directory looks like. So let's say um, you're looking for low vision services, and I live in Pennsylvania. I know that the Sydney Cancer Center is in Pennsylvania, so let's just say we're looking in Pennsylvania for now, and we click search. And hopefully it doesn't take too long, but if it does, you'll see <laughs> you have the option to be able to go through that list. Oh, here we go. And up here, other agencies offering low vision services. And up will pop all these different places where you can contact with their phone numbers in different areas of Pennsylvania. Um, so it's a really great resource. And Vision Aware is part of um, AFB, American um, Foundation for the Blind. And it, I, I really just highly recommend using this resource. It's really a wonderful um, a wonderful resource for figuring out where you need to go or what's around you. Okay, thanks, Emily. You're welcome. <laughs> so last but not least, um, I want to introduce everybody to uh, Aaron Davis. Um, Aaron is a father of six, originally diagnosed with ocular melanoma in August of 2016 after a long career in high tech. The original tumor was large and tested at high risk class two. He underwent proton beam therapy um, in his left eye, and uh, he continued to enjoy his family and passion of bike racing, competing in France just a week after his surgery. Um, he's an avid advocate for the OM community in his own health, and he entered an experimental year-long adjuvant trial before being diagnosed with metastatic disease in 2018. He began a trial of IMC-GP100 in February of 2019, and while he has some new small tumors 
tumors in his liver and spine. He remains on the trial and overall stable. Um, Aaron, always a pleasure to have you and really excited um, to have you just kind of talk about your story and your journey. Oh, and you're muted. Sorry, Aaron. Unmute myself. How's that? Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, I, thanks for the introduction, and it's a, a great honor and pleasure to be here with uh, some of these very, very prestigious names that are in the uh, OM category. Uh, I would say, in addition to the um, points that were mentioned in the introduction, I'd like to emphasize a few points uh, as well, particularly on the issue of surveillance. Uh, before I get that, um, I'd like to point out my priorities, as already mentioned. I have one wife, six kids, and at last count, 22 bicycles. So uh, that's been my passion. And my diagnosis came uh, about two days after a race when I had the classic symptom of a curtain dropping across my left eye. But that's not really the story because that, that was pretty classic for many OM patients. The story is I actually went in for a normal vision. Uh, I had a vision and a dentist appointment scheduled the same week. And I went in for a, a normal vision um, test, which I went, I'd normally go every couple of years, including dilation. Uh, but I would normally go to like the, you know, the strip mall center place or, you know, the one that would give you the, the 15 minute uh, diagnosis, what have you. Two days after that is when I had the retinal care and I went into a retina specialist um, who was referred uh, by, by uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear and he could see the tumor with his naked eye. So the first lesson here for any uh, patients is make sure you're talking to people that know what they're doing. So a tumor that a specialist could see with his naked eye was missed by the general mall service providing vision uh, tests down the street. And that applies uh, after diagnosis as well. There's many names here on, on today's event. And of course, many names within the community with a rare cancer because you have a lot of passion and concern and care and a lot of expertise. So in terms of mistakes you want to avoid, the first one is uh, don't go to a generalist and expect a generalist to be able to talk about the things that uh, Dr. Sato and Dr. Patel and other folks can talk about. So um, I wanted to talk about the diagnosis, but then I wanted to talk about um, action and my, out, my own personal outlook. So action in the human condition is a great antidote for anxiety. And when you have a diagnosis like this, you're going to have anxiety. There's no doubt about it. But the worst thing you can do is stew on it. Actually, that's the second worst. The worst thing you can do is go uh, absorb most of what Google says because it's mostly outdated. There's uh, a lot of uh, incredible science that's been done that hasn't been caught up yet. Um, and so you're going to drive yourself crazy Googling, which I did immediately after diagnosis. And when I went up to Massachusetts Eye and Ear, I saw Dr. Kim again, who's a really uh, well-known specialist in, in this field. Um, she's fantastic. But as I was leaving, um, just as I was uh, starting my treatment, I, they, they provided like a therapist person. And this person asked me, he was, he was great, but he asked me like 25 different questions about my life and my social condition and my finances and things like this. And I was thinking, why the hell is he asking me all this stuff? What, how is this relevant? And finally, he said, you know, he looked me in the eye, he said, I want you to know no one dies of eye cancer. He said, I know you're scared and you're worried, but nobody dies from eye cancer. So go home, relax. So I came home and, of course, I told my wife, nobody dies from this. Uh, and she had been on Google all day. And, of course, she said, of course nobody dies from the eye cancer. That's why you have two eyes. You're going to die from something that comes from metastases. And as has been pointed out, the liver is the, is the really uh, focus there. Um, so from, from my perspective, I've been up and down with stress, relaxation, stress, relaxation. But above all, it's the action and taking action that allows me to kind of face every day, not just with calmness, but with the a little bit of excitement because there, there are some upsides to having a diagnosis. One of them is you don't want to miss any day. 
You really don't want to miss any hour of any day, whether it's doing something for yourself, something for your, your family, your kids, what have you, or even a friend. So the actions I took, of course, I got treatment. And in addition, to give you a little bit more color, uh, my, my primary uh, ocular uh, oncologist is Dr. Carpohol out of New York City at Columbia. And he's fantastic. And um, he, uh, he encouraged me right away to go on a trial. And you'll find uh, in the early days, of course, there's lots of trials that work great on mice. And so we had a trial that worked great on mice. And I was going to be one of the first humans doing this. This was the trial of chrysotinib. And to give you an idea, I was living in Paris at the time. My wife is French. And uh, I flew back every month uh, on my personal, on my personal uh, finances to get a, a pill that, in retrospect, you know, it was for about a year. And that was to prevent metastases. And it wasn't successful. And I'd have to say that the side effects were quite brutal. Uh, I, I, I couldn't ride my bike. My heart rate was suppressed, so I was constantly uh, tired because of that. Um, and as I said, a year and a half later or so, I did get metastases in my liver. But the trial I've been on since then uh, more or less has kept me alive and kept me really in, you know, there's some pain and fatigue and things like this, but kept me in, in an enviable spot. And for that, I drive down from Newport, Rhode Island to uh, New York City once a week for an infusion. My, my lesson here is you got to try stuff. Um, and to try stuff, you have to have the genetic test because that's the ticket. It's the entry ticket to some of the fantastic clinical trials that I'm sure you heard about in the previous session. So get the genetic test. That's a key action. And obviously, or not obviously, but you do that normally at the time of biopsy and before you have any treatment. Uh, the next action I took was I, of course, got all my personal papers and will and all that stuff got together. But I also made a point to think about people that, you know, I've had issues with in the past. And I reached out to them and just caught up with them and, you know, buried the hatchet in a few cases, had a drink in some other cases. And this wasn't because of some, you know, metaphys metaphysical concern about, you know, the afterlife or something. It was mostly that stress is very bad. And it's particularly bad if you're trying to get your immune system to fight off a cancer. So any stress that you have in your life and personal stress, financial stress, any stress that you can have, you got to eliminate from your life, even if it means making the first phone call to someone that maybe you don't even like anymore. So get that done. Uh, from a financial standpoint, when I got metastases, I hadn't even thought about it, but on one of the fabulous uh, Facebook support groups, um, that exist for this uh, ocular melanoma, particularly for metastases. Uh, they were talking about going on uh, getting disability from being stage four. I had never even thought about it, but I called up and sure enough, I was immediately eligible. I um, was able to just submit the paperwork I needed and the state even made it retroactive back to my first point of diagnosis. And that was great because now my children are taken care of till they're 18. My wife is taken care of. Um, you know, if I, if I do die soon and, you know, that was a financial thing in action that I took. And again, that's available to anybody um, in, in the U.S. at least. The other action I did was I bought a new car and I didn't buy a new car because, uh, you know, I was in a midlife crisis or anything. I bought a new car because, um, as the last speaker pointed out, uh, technology is important. And the new cars today for low vision people are outstanding. And on that weekly commute, I, I go down to New York. I've been on going every week for two years now. It's a 400 mile round trip. My life has been saved. No, no kidding. My life has been saved half a dozen times because of uh, blind spot monitoring, adaptive tracking that the cars have. So basically choose the car you want, but all the good ones now, the new ones have uh, uh, some incredible technology that will make your life a lot easier if you have that decision. And then, uh, you know, the outlook for me, I realize, of course, there's a treatment and there's a physical piece of it and physical activity. I've been riding in, I've been racing again uh, before COVID, I was racing all over the world, uh, finishing first in the Columbia Challenge, which I hope you guys come out and do for raising funds for uh, ocular melanoma research. We hope to do that again in uh, October, I think, this year. 
COVID will, of course, make the final decision. But I also uh, saw therapists, I saw hypnotists, I um, uh, took advantage of a recommendation also on the Facebook group to uh, get Ritalin prescribed from a palliative care, which is incredible because again, you don't know how many days you have, but um, you wanna make the most of every day that you do. So the days that I feel fatigue, I can kind of sense it when I wake up, it's gonna be a bad day. I'm able to take advantage of the Ritalin prescription and basically have a great day. And that makes a huge difference. And many peers that I see suffering through fatigue, uh, that's an action you can take and your medical staff is uh, happy to do that for you. But the last thing I did psychologically was I made it a point to go find out uh, books, first person stories, you know, diaries and such of people through no fault of their own have found themselves just in insanely difficult conditions, usually historical conditions like, you know, you're in Pompeii and the, uh, and the volcano's erupting or you're uh, on the Russian front and you're trying to get back to Paris uh, with Napoleon, just, just really, really brutal stories. And they're, uh, as a history, crazy history nut, uh, you know, I find them very interesting but as a perspective, I found them very, very valuable as well. Uh, just to understand that, look, adversity is a part of life. Uh, when something happens to you, it's not just what's happened to you. It's about what you're going to do with it. And uh, just to close, I would say, you know, take advantage of the community. Take advantage of, um, of events like this. But the community is very tight, very active. There's incredible knowledge. There's many, many, many long-term survivors of this uh, cancer. I hope to be one of them. So far, so good. There are many who are happy to share their experiences with you. You can reach out to them on Facebook. And, and I'll close with uh, the final quote. I, I didn't make it up, of course. I read it somewhere. But the quote was, uh, you know, a, a, a visitor comes in to see a cancer patient getting an infusion and ask them, you know, what is it like to wake up every day knowing that you're dying? And the patient came back to the guest and said, what is it like to wake up every day and pretend that you're not? And of course, that, that is my ultimate lesson, which is it's hard to find good in something like cancer, but I've been able to do it with a great community, a great medical team, great support from my family and so forth. And uh, it's really, really allowed me to um, make the most, it's a cliche, but make, make the most of every single day I have in front of me. So thanks again for this opportunity. And I'm on Facebook if anybody wants to reach me or talk to me about anything else. Thanks a lot. Aaron, always is such a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, we are at the top of the hour. So, um, I know that we had some questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask just the speakers kind of look at that and maybe answer those real fast. Um, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time because it's been um, an event that started um, almost two hours ago. So I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Dr. Sarah Selig to jump back on so we can go ahead and close this out um, if possible. But first and foremost, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, it's been an amazing experience. Um, it's our first mini summit, which is exciting. So thank you for all for making this um, as fantastic as um, you could. Um, I'm going to share my screen again really fast. Um, let's see if we can get this going. Let's see. And Lauren, while you're while you're doing that, I'll just thank everyone so much. And um, and you know, I was able to thank the first panel, but just thank you so much to the second panel. And um, Aaron, I, um, every time I hear you speak, you give me words to live by. So um, I just want to thank you for that. And I um, often pass your words uh, on, on to others. Uh, you're such an inspiration to, to me and so many. Um, so um, I think I have a list of some announcements. Um, so um, just a reminder that the sessions today were recorded and will be available in um, the next few days on our YouTube channel. So um, stay tuned for that and we will um, put information on social media um, so you can access the recordings. Um, and then Lauren, is it right that there will be a survey link um, in the chat here or will it be emailed out? Yes. Yes. Okay. Which one? 
Um, both. Both. Okay. So please fill out the survey. Um, so much of our programming and our work as an organization um, is patient led and directed. And so we always appreciate feedback and um, it's, it's helpful to know what topics you all want to hear. Um, and uh, in this new virtual space, we're able to be uh, sort of innovative. Um, so please uh, give us your feedback um, in the surveys. And then um, just a couple dates that you see on this slide here. So stay tuned. Uh, for the launch of uh, the Vision Registry, which you've heard about now for uh, several years, that will be coming next month. Um, and then our next uh, virtual Eyes on a Cure Patient Caregiver Symposium will be the weekend of November 20th, 2021. And hopefully that will be our last virtual gathering for some time, looking forward to an in-person meeting um, next spring, uh, which you see here in March, 2022. Uh, we are banking at this point on an in-person Eyes on a Cure Summit uh, in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you to all of our panelists and, um, and just for the community. It's really amazing to be able to be in community even during these tough times with COVID in the virtual space, um, but I find it meaningful and, um, and I hope you all do too. So thank you so much and look forward to uh, being together again soon.